Okay, hi everyone. Um, we are going to get started with uh, today's session. So, thank, uh, first of all, thank, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, we're going to have a really nice session uh, on the theme of honeybee genomics. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Sonia Enar, and I'm a, a postdoc at uh, INRAE in, in France. Um, and I'm working on honeybee genomics. That's why we are organizing this workshop today with Alain Vignal, that is a senior researcher at the same institute and that will be uh, um, in charge of uh, taking questions uh, after the presentations. So today we are gonna hear uh, great talks um, about very topics on honeybee genomics from Matthew Webster, that is a professor at um, Uppsala University in Sweden and that will tell us more uh, about recombination in uh, in eusocial insect and uh, honeybee uh, particularly. Um, then we'll have a presentation by Julia Jones, that is assistant professor uh, at uh, University College in Dublin, and she will uh, walk us through a career, uh, telling us what she's been doing, um, working on the evolution of eusociality in insects towards the more applied aspects of what you can do on honeybee genomics. And finally, we'll have a presentation uh, from Amro Zayed, that is a re research chair, chair in genomics at York University. And uh, that will tell us more about a project that he is uh, currently involved in that is called BCSI, and that looks at uh, uh, honeybee health and diagnostic tools. Okay, so before we start, um, I will remind you that uh, you can find a lot of information about the whole um, sessions that we had throughout spring uh, on the AGSX 2021 website. Uh, there's been great uh, sessions in the past, the, the past few months on insect genomic technologies to improve food application that was uh, monitored by uh, Brenda Hopper uh, and that was really, really interesting. Then we had a session on arthropod genomics and genome engineering um, chaired by Lindsay Perkins. And finally, last month, we had a session on application of new genomic tools and techniques in arthropods that was uh, chaired by Marcel Lorenzen. You can find all the recordings from this previous session on the YouTube channel of the i5K and on this link that you will find at the bottom of my slide. Um, I want to remind everyone to please put your questions in the Q&A box and um, you have quite some information on the chat with links to the website, to a Slack channel uh, and reminder to ask your question on the Q&A box. Um, and now I'll let Brad walk us through this uh, nice acknowledgement slide. Oh, thank you, Sonia. And always we like to put these at the beginning and just really like to thank everybody who's made all these, not just session number four that we're currently in, but all prior sessions. All the session organizers that Sonia just kind of went over, Brenda, Lindsay, Marseille, and the current session, Sonia and Aling. Uh, really appreciate all the work you've taken or time you put in for organizing this. It's not easy as people think. And I guess I'm Brad Coates. I uh, forgot to introduce myself. I'm a research geneticist at USGA and I'm the head of, I guess head, I don't really have a proper title, but of the ARS Arthropod Genomics Research Working Group, which is kind of co-sponsoring this and has allowed us to work with um, Glenn Haynes, who's done a lot of work in the background, running all the um, ins and outs of the Zoom. He's a master at it, and I'm thankful for all of his knowledge. As well as Pia Olson, she's logged in and she's been coordinating all the video downloads and distributions um, and playing them during all of our sessions. And there's a lot, a lot of support in the background um, using the I5K resources. Um, Dr. Anna Childers um, from ARS as well, she's been putting up all the um, YouTube channel videos, been posting those using the Twitter account to get the word out to everybody and then uh, designed the website for us. And additional, we want to acknowledge Rob Waterhouse. Um, he's been running through the Arthropod news feeds as well as the i5K Slack channel that um, is currently in the chat box if you wish to join. Encourage all participants to do so. 
It'll be live link for the next 30 days. So please take advantage of that resource. And of course, all of our speakers uh, we can't obviously uh, have a symposium without their input, their time, their effort, their knowledge, and they're willing to, to participate. And last but not least, all of our participants, thank you for joining. And with that, I'll turn it back to Sonia. Okay, thank you very much, Brad. Um, so yeah, well, we're gonna get started. So just I remind you, please ask any questions you may have for the speakers on the Q&A box. They will be able to answer during the talk as the talk is recorded. Uh, and at the end of the talk, we'll have a short question. And at the end of the session, there will be a more general discussion with the three presenters uh, being there to answer any more questions you may have. Okay, uh, so we will be started with a talk from Matthew Webster. Uh, so as I said earlier, he's professor at Uppsala University, Sweden. Uh, he's mainly interested in using population genomics to understand molecular basis of ecological adaptation, the evolution of recombination and the process of speciation, with particular focus on bees. Today he's going to tell us more about uh, the cause and consequences of extreme recombination rate in honeybees. And the floor is... I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I'm going to talk about a topic which I find extremely fascinating, which is the causes of recombination rate variation, and in particular, the reasons why recombination rate is uh, such extreme levels in honeybees and other social insects. So recombination is a process which occurs during meiotic cell divisions in uh, sexually reproducing organisms, and it leads to the shuffling of genetic material from one generation to the next. Um, it's a process which has both costs and benefits. Mechanistically, it's required for the correct chromosomal disjunction so that the correct number of chromosomes uh, appear in each daughter cell. Um, and without it, uh, aneuploidy can occur, which is severely deleterious, but it can also lead to rearrangements, which are also um, a deleterious outcome. Um, evolutionarily, it's widely accepted that the benefit of recombination is that it generates beneficial combinations of alleles, which both facilitate positive selection and allow the uh, um, efficient removal of deleterious genetic variants. But it is also a process which can break up favorable combinations of genetic variation, genetic variants, um, and therefore can sometimes be selected against. If we look at variation in recombination across taxa um, from this meta-analysis, it's clear that there's extremely large variation, suggesting that um, these uh, differences are likely to be governed by selection and that recombination is a trait which um, reaches an optimal value uh, governed by selection. And if we particularly look here, you can see um, important for this talk is that honeybee has one of the highest recombination rates recorded among all animals, and that uh, this recombination rate is an order of magnitude higher than Drosophila, for example. So recom uh, recombination rates are extreme in social insects. There are a number of questions we'd like to understand about recombination rate variation. For example, how and why does it vary across taxa? Uh, what are the selective forces that govern it? And in particular, um, why do we have such high recombination rates in the social insects? We'd also like to understand why it varies between individuals. Uh, here it's clear that uh, some of this variation is heritable and uh, several genes have been identified which, uh, which govern this variation. The most well-known of these being PRDM9, which uh, um, causes recombination events to occur in hotspots in humans and other mammals. 
uh, but also like to understand how and why it varies across the genome. As I said, recombination occurs in hotspots, which are governed by specific motifs in mammals, um, but not in other in, in many other species. And uh, we'd also like to understand whether variation in recombination across the genome could be mediated select by uh, selection or not. Um, this is a graph which shows variation in recombination rates among animal taxa, which has a long tail. And you can see that among these uh, species with extreme recombination rates, we find all of the apis that have been measured, which are all social insects. And then other social insects, which um, are, are also find, found in uh, with above average levels of recombination rate, um, suggesting that sociality is a, um, or all social insects have extreme recombination rates. Um, so why, why do they have these extreme rates? Well, there's uh, a number of different hypotheses that have been um, proposed that have, can be divided into these different categories. One idea is that uh, um, it's a selective advantage to have uh, increased genetic diversity uh, among workers within colonies. This could be something that uh, prevents parasites from taking over in a colony, or it could be something which allows, uh, or allows workers to become more specialized on different tasks, so prevent, um, generates a, a more diverse workforce. Another possibility is that um, elevated recombination generates reduced variation in relatedness, which might prevent kin conflict. Another idea has been that uh, uh, the uh, evolution of sociality uh, has been facilitated by higher rates, and in particular, um, higher rates in genes that have been involved in the development of a sterile sterile worker class, which is a key feature of sociality, may have had higher recombination rates in order to uh, um, allow rapid evolution. Or there may be another aspect of their biology which uh, hasn't been considered that might be important in uh, selecting for higher rates. So these hypotheses, hypotheses can be investigated by analyzing variation between taxa, individuals, um, and between genes across the genome and the, and the causes for why this variation occurs. And several methods have been used to study variation in honeybees and other uh, social insects. Uh, uh, a couple of these take advantage of the fact that uh, we have haploid drones in, in honeybees, which means that if you uh, genotype markers across the genome in, in a set of drones, you can determine where recombination rates have occurred. Uh, if you don't have a genome sequence, then this can be used to generate a genetic map, which can then be used to order contigs and helps to, uh, to generate a genome sequence. But now that we have the genome sequence, what we can do is to perform whole genome sequencing of multiple individuals and use these to determine where specific recombination events have occurred um, in each meiosis. Another method that can be used is based on uh, patterns of linkage disequilibrium. So if we sequence a random sample of honeybees, it's uh, possible to uh, look at variation in uh, linkage disequilibrium and use statistical methods based on uh, based on haplotype structure and uh, um, coalescent theory to determine variation and recombination rate across the genome. And then uh, if we also have an estimate of effective population size, it's then possible to convert these estimates into absolute uh, measures of recombination. So what I'm gonna talk about today are three different studies that are performed that use these different methods that try to understand uh, variation in recombination rate um, in social insects and its causes, and also trying to address this question of why recombination rates in social insects are so high. Um, the first of these studies is uh, um, uses patterns of linkage disequilibrium to uh, understand recombination rate 
variation in Apis mellifera. What we did here was to take a random sample of African honeybees um, using whole genome sequencing and uh, the program LDHAT, which uh, um, analyzed variation and recombination rate across the genome. Here you can see uh, some overall results of this, um, which suggests that there is variation in, in recombination rate across the 16 chromosomes. And we infer that the average crossover frequency is about 26 centimorgans per megabase. Here you can see the um, distribution of uh, um, recombination events um, across in honeybees. And what this suggests is that the, the distribution is relatively uniform across the genome. So in honeybees, we have 50% of crossovers occurring in about 30% uh, of the genome. If we compare this to humans, about 50% of recombination events would occur in, a, in less than 10% of the genome. And the reason for this is that recombination in, honey, in humans occurs mainly in hotspots, whereas in honeybees, we don't seem to have uh, substantial recombination hotspots. Um, what we find to be one of the major factors that affect variation and recombination rate is, uh, is whether it occurs in uh, coding sequences or not. So coding sequences in, in honeybees have uh, significantly reduced levels of recombination, whereas intronic and intergenic regions have uh, elevated rates. Um, so what we wanted to understand next was how levels of gene expression or um, gene body methylation, which uh, methylation occurs mainly in genes in honeybees, how these would affect recombination rate variation. This, is, uh, this shows the distribution of the observed over expected um, CPG uh, pattern in the honeybee genome. CPG over expected is a, a good measure of uh, levels of methylation in the germline because of the hypermutability of CPG sites. And so what this suggests is um, the uh, um, non-coding portion of the honeybee genome is mainly not methylated, whereas genes have this bimodal distribution, which also correlates with the uh, um, patterns of gene expression. So how does this affect uh, levels of uh, recombination? So what you can see here is the uh, recombination rate of different genes, which are divided up according to patterns of caste biased gene expression, where we've compared workers with queens uh, or workers with drones, uh, taking uh, two published data sets. And what you can see here is that while these uh, differences in gene expression do seem to uh, correlate with differences in crossover rate, the main uh, correlation is uh, between uh, the different uh, methylation classes that are um, inferred, inferred by uh, levels of uh, um, CPGs uh, within the genome. So uh, more highly methylated genes tend to have lower crossover rates. Um, so in summary of this uh, uh, first study, we see um, we confirm that there are extreme recombination rates in Apis mellifera, and we find that uh, germline uh, DNA methylation we infer to be the strongest correlative um, variation in the genome. Um, and this is uh, consistent with the findings in other animals and plants, um, and in particular in Arabidopsis, where it's been uh, shown that uh, DNA methylation is an important uh, correlate of. Uh, um, of uh, recombination rate variation and uh, suggests that the, there's a mechanic, mechanistic explanation for variation and recombination rate between genes in the honeybee and that uh, it could be related to uh, access to um, access to the genome by the recombination machinery which may be uh, inhibited by DNA methylation in the germline. So next, what we wanted to do was to compare these um, patterns with uh, what we find in solitary bees. Uh, 
So we used uh, a random sample of uh, a population sample of uh, the solitary bee uh, Megakali rotundata, the leaf cutter bee. Um, and what we see here is that indeed uh, this solitary bee has a um, much lower recombination rate, which is uh, consistent with the uh, average among other mammals of one centimorgan per megabase. Here you can see the decay of linkage disequilibrium, uh, which suggests that in Apis mellifera, there's basically uh, um, almost no linkage disequilibrium anywhere in the genome, um, but, th but it's higher in megakylie. Uh, also, we see a similar pattern whereby uh, um, coding sequences um, seem to have lower rates of recombination. Um, if we then compare the patterns we saw before in uh, the honeybee and in, uh, in the solitary bee, we can see that the patterns are, are broadly similar. So DNA methylation in Apis mellifera um, and also the CPG observed over expected ratio predicts recombination rate in, in both species. So um, genes seem to have a, a relatively uh, conserved recombination rate uh, between the species, even though the overall rate um, has changed very uh, um, significantly. Um, also, we find that these uh, correlations that we saw between uh, um, gene expression uh, between uh, genes in Apis mellifera um, seem to be similar in uh, the solitary bee. So the worker-based uh, genes in Apis mellifera seem to have slightly elevated rates in both species. So this suggests that um, the uh, relative uh, recombination rate of different genes is uh, roughly consistent across uh, the solitary and the uh, social bee, suggesting there haven't been very big changes in recombination rate landscape uh, correlated with uh, the evolution of sociality. Another thing that we wanted to look at was whether um, recombination rate has been important in uh, uh, the evolution of uh, particular genes, particularly those that might be involved in sociality. Um, so to do this, we looked at the DNA, DNDS ratio, which is a measure of uh, um, the rate of protein evolution along the uh, branches leading to Apis mellifera and those leading to uh, the solitary bee. And here what we found is there's absolutely no correlation between DNDS and the rate of uh, crossing over, which suggests that uh, recombination rate is uh, not an important factor in modulating uh, the uh, um, rate of evolution of specific genes in uh, in the in either of these species or or in the evolution of uh, um, sociality. So, in conclusion, for this study, we see that there's uh, an extremely elevated average recombination rate in the social bee compared to the solitary one. Um, but there seems to be a similar distribution of rates among genes uh, in each species, um, suggesting that uh, there's uh, not so much evidence that uh, changes in recombination have been focused on specific genes or that they modulate the rate of protein evolution in, in bees. Um, so uh, <clears throat> finally, we wanted to understand uh, um, individual variation in recombination rates within species. Um, here we used mellifera and Bombus terrestris. So here we used uh, um, experimental determination of, uh, um, of recombination rate variation by sequencing multiple drones from, from the same colonies. And here you can see that if you have sequences of uh, um, multiple drones, in a particular region, you can reconstruct the haplotypes of the queen uh, and all of the drones and determine uh, regions where uh, recombination of events have occurred. And so what we did was to uh, use this method to compare recombination rate variation in uh, 31 different colonies that came both from different subspecies of uh, Apis mellifera and from uh, 
Bombus terrestris. Um, here you can see how recombination rate varies between these different uh, groups. So you can see there's uh, differences in uh, recombination rate to, between, uh, apparently between different subspecies of honeybee and also between the um, between Bombus terrestris, um, although the uh, the numbers of the two different subspecies of uh, honeybee are rather small, so it's unclear whether these uh, um, differences are, are significant. But one thing that is obvious is that there's very large variation between colonies of both species, um, suggesting that there's substantial variation in recombination rate to between individual queens. And so this uh, level of variation is that we see between 26 and 94 crossovers uh, per meiosis um, between different drones. And we can also partition this variation um, between colonies. So if we take just the European Apis mellifera uh, and use a ANOVA framework, we find that 45% of uh, variation in recombination rate occurs between colonies and the rest occurs between drones. And uh, this can be used to estimate uh, broad sense heritability, and which is estimated at 0.44. So a, a substantial amount of heritable variation in recombination rate uh, between colonies. And this, uh, is a reasonably high value, but it's within the um, uh, it's comparable to other estimates that have been uh, that come from uh, experimental animals, domestic animals, and uh, and uh, estimates from the wild. So, in conclusion, we see that there is substantial individual variation in recombination rate in bees, which uh, can can be a possible raw material for selection and that it has a, um, a high heritability. So what does this all tell us about why we have high recombination rates in social insects and about recombination rate variation? Well, we see that there is extreme recombination rate in Apis mellifera uh, and a complete absence of Linkus to seek critibium. Uh, um, but it seems that these uh, recombination rates were elevated genome-wide and not uh, driven by uh, elevation in specific genes. So we think that this tells us that there's probably, and also we find that there's no uh, influence of recombination rate on protein evolution. So this probably tells us that it's unlikely that uh, the uh, higher recombination rates have driven uh, evolution of uh, specific genes in sociality. And more likely that there's a direct benefit of increasing genotypic diversity in, uh, in offspring in, in social insects, although the ultimate driver of this is unknown. However, uh, this is uh, quite promising for the future because uh, we identify substantial heritable variation uh, between individuals, which will allow us in the future to test uh, effects of selection regimes or perturbations, which could affect recombination rate and possibly identify genes that are important for recombination rate variation in honeybees. Um, we also see that there's substantial variation between species, which will allow us to uh, test for the effect of different uh, life history characteristics and differences in biology of uh, different uh, um, social species which will allow us to uh, understand which specific aspects are important in generating this selection for increased recombination rates. So honeybees will be, uh, and other social insects will be a, a very important model for understanding uh, the determinants of uh, recombination rate variation and what causes it to vary um, in the future. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the, the main people that uh, worked on this study, uh, Andreas Wahlberg, Julia Jones, and Takashi Kawakami, other members of my uh, group, 
and also uh, important collaborators that uh, made this work possible. So thank you very much for listening and I look forward to questions. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Matthew, for your uh, nice talk. Um, uh, so we just have time for a very quick questions. There's been a couple of questions in the chat about um, um, what goes on in other social species, such as ants or termites. Do you know uh, anything about recombination rates in, in, in these species? Is it also very high? Well, I can tell you that uh, we have a project to look at it in termites. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, um, I, we have a project to look at it in termites, so we don't know yet, but, but we're working on that. Um, the ants that have been studied so far have uh, high rates, but not as high as apis. Not as high, even with similar or equivalent colony sizes, because I suppose you could also have in ants uh, different, uh, you know, different species will have different a uh, number of workers and castes and all the rest? As far as I am aware, there's not the data to test those things yet from ants. But uh, obviously, that's a, a very interesting question to look at. Yeah, okay. So, well, thank you very much. We're not going to spend too much time right now, but I think there comes probably some very interesting questions about uh, relations between uh, recombination rate and fitness, given the fact that you have uh, differences uh, within a species. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Um, well, I guess, um, in, a, in a way, having a lot of variation within species is potentially surprising if there's very high selection for, uh, for, for recombination rate, for a particular recombination rate. Um, but I think also the, the fact that there's a lot of variation gives us the possibility to test uh, what the effect of different uh, selective regimes might have on, on recombination rate. Okay, I guess we lost that on. <laughs> yeah, he's frozen. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Matt. And I'm sure we're going to have uh, more questions for uh, the discussion after all the presentations. Um, sure. So, yeah, I guess now we are going to move on with uh, Julia's talk to keep with track. Uh, if you want, there's questions in the Q&A. You can answer them uh, live to the, to the audience, Matt. Okay, uh, so I'm going to introduce uh, Julia Jones now. Julia is an assistant professor uh, in the School of Biology and Environmental Science at University College Dublin. Her research focuses on understanding the diversification of species, so genetic ecology, behavior, sociality, and morphology, and the driving forces behind adaptive responses. Uh, she's currently working on a research project investigating the relationship between honeybee colony losses and different stress factors and genotypes, as well as between different geographic regions in Ireland. Today, she will present some of her work on the investigation of evolution and maintenance of complex society, going from fanning bees to uh, snip chip development. Hello everyone, my name is Julia Jones and I'm an assistant professor at the University College Dublin in Ireland. I'd like to thank the organisers a lot for this opportunity to come and talk uh, here today. So I'd like to tell you a bit about some of the work we've been doing, looking at the evolution and maintenance of complex societies, from fanning bees, so behavioural genetics, to SNP chip development, the development of a SNP chip tool for the honeybee um, community. There are many interesting examples of cooperative societies in the social insects in particular. Here in the top left, you can see an example of the Asian honeybees, Apis florea, that nest out in the open. In the centre, you can see termites in northern Australia, 
then there's bumblebees, honeybees, paper, paper wasps, and also uh, dinosaur ants from coming from Brazil. These social insects have been of interest to evolutionary biologists since Darwin's time, and as Darwin suggested, I confine myself to one special difficulty. These neuters, so the workers, often differ widely in instinct and in structure from both the males and fertile females, and yet from being sterile, they cannot propagate their, their kind. So this is referring to the fact that in social insect colonies such as honeybees, the workers do not reproduce. Our understanding of this conundrum was largely revolutionised by Hamilton's sem seminal papers, where he explained this paradox via kin selection, so in other words, where individuals gain fitness by helping their relatives. Here you can see uh, Bill Hamilton actually on one of his last uh, trips to the Congo that a colleague of mine was, was uh, lucky enough to have gone on. So as you can see in this schematic, if, if this guy here on the left helps out his brother, who shares half of his genes, then although his own fitness is reduced, the his brother's uh, fitness is increased and his genes are transmitted to the next generation. Now this is all well and good, but how is it actually decided who does what tasks? In any honeybee colony, the workers do a myriad of different tasks, including foraging for pollen, foraging for nectar, tending the queen, tending the brood, thermoregulating the colony, performing hygienic behaviour to remove diseased brood, and so on. There's a number of different parameters that sort of influence this division of labour or task allocation, including the age of the workers, the environment that they're exposed to and where the colony is, and also the genotype. We know that division of labour is very important in the ecological success of social insects, and I've been very interested in this topic since the beginning of my academic career. For example, back in my PhD, I wanted to investigate further what are the mechanisms underlying division of labour. So in order to do this, I investigated the task of thermoregulation, so the heating and cooling of the colony. In particular, I was looking at the, the cooling of the colony. And, and one, one specific task to do this is fanning. In this task, as you can see, on, uh, uh, the, what this worker is doing on the left-hand side, um, workers stand stationary at the entrance to the colony and fan their wings to drive warm air out. So in this experiment, we expose colonies to different temperatures. So we heated them up over a period of time. We sampled workers performing the task of fanning. And then we took these, these workers back to the lab where we could genotype them and, and look at the genotype of individuals performing the task of fanning at different temperatures. And what we find is that genetic diversity among workers is important for effective division of labour. So genetically different workers or different patrilines, because in, in any honeybee colony the queen mates with multiple males, so the workers have the same mother but different fathers. So genetically different workers, so those with different fathers, what we find is have different thresholds for performing the task of fanning. So we see here in this figure that patrilines two and three in green and purple are represented in high proportions at all temperatures, um, suggesting they have lower thresholds for performing the task of fanning. By comparison, patriline 4 here in yellow is represented in, in low proportions at low temperatures and higher proportions at higher temperatures, suggesting it has a higher threshold um, for performing the task of fanning. So in this section of work, we find that genetic diversity among workers appears to be important for effective division of labour. So I've, as you've just seen, genetically different workers or different patrilines appear to have different thresholds for performing the task of fanning. We also find that genetic diversity and variable task threshold are important for maintaining a stable brood nest temperature. In the middle picture, you can see an example of our experimental setup where we compared genetically diverse colonies where the queen had been, was open mated and so mated with, you know, from 10 to 20 drones when we compared these genetically diverse colonies with genetically uniform colonies where the queen was artificially inseminated with the semen of a single drone, what we find is that ge the genetically diverse colonies are better able to maintain a stable brood nest temperature than the genetically uniform colonies. And in a ca comparative study on the Asian honeybee, so the open nesting Asian honeybee species Apis florea, we find similar results 
um, in that genetically different workers have different thresholds for performing the task of fanning. So I wanted to next I wanted to ask what else what else affects honeybee behavior and health. And a key candidate in this is the gut microbial community. So the gut microbial community is a, is a key component in the ecological and evolutionary success of all different animals. And it can benefit the host by helping to digest food, detoxify harmful molecules, protect against pathogens and parasites, modulate development and immunity, and so on. However, we're really only just beginning to understand many of the causes and consequences of changes in the gut bacterial community. Now, interestingly, in recent years, it's been shown that adult honeybees and, and bumblebees, so also it shows social bees, have been shown to harbor a relatively simple and unique um, gut microbi microbiota that is not present in the solitary bees, for example. So this suggests that sociality um, fac facilitates the vertical transmission of gut bacteria and allows for the coevolution of the host and gut bacteria that may be critical to bee health. This means that any kind of perturbation in this sort of in this core microbial community may be detrimental. Um, interestingly, it's also been shown, particularly in vertebrates, including in, and particularly in mammals, humans and rats and mice and so on, that there is a that, that there is a relationship, uh, bidirectional relationship between the gut bacteria community and the brain. So there are effects. There's sort of an interaction between the gut bacteria community and the behaviours that different animals perform. And this has particularly been shown in vertebrates so far. So here we wanted to ask, do honeybees exposed to different environments and performing different tasks or behaviours harbour different bacterial communities? So we approach this by exposing honeybee colonies to different landscape types. So as you can see here, fields of oilseed rape where near nicotinoid pesticides had been used were compared with agricultural landscapes uh, where neonicotinoid pesticides had not been used. In another experiment, we set up age-matched and marked colonies of honeybees and observed the behaviours they were performing. Then in both of these cases, we characterised the gut microbial communities of the bees um, using amplicon sequencing, so using 16S. Now what we find is that the overall patterns of community composition between bees exposed to different uh, landscape types is, is pretty similar. So in the top panel here, for example, we see bees exposed to fields of oilseed rape. And in the bottom panel, we see bees exposed to fields of agriculture fields distant to fields of oilseed rape. Now overall, we find a significant but small difference in gut, gut microbial communities in global comparisons. And specifically, what we find is that core taxa uh, differ in the relative abundance between these landscape types. So we don't find a difference in the actual taxa or species present in these different communities of bees exposed to different landscape types, but rather a difference in the relative abundance of some of those core taxa. For example, here, um, Bartonella apis is higher in regions distant to oil seed rape, whereas a taxa assigned, assigned, to, the assigned to the same class is actually higher in fields of oilseed rape. And then again, um, taxa assigned to the Acetobacteria ACA is higher also um, in fields of oilseed rape. So what do these kinds of differences, differences mean? Well, these, these results can be interpreted on the basis of previous results by Philip Engel and his team, where they showed that the gene functional category found to be enriched in honeybee gut bacteria is carbohydrate metabolism and transport, perhaps not surprising given that bees are often dealing with pollen and honey. Um, and the carbohydrate-related function found to be enriched across all bacteria taxa were proteins that show homology to drug-resistant efflux pumps. So uh, this kind of function is potentially selected upon when bees are exposed to different landscape types and such things as different different pesticide usage. In the second experiment, where we formed colonies of similarly aged workers, observed their behaviours, and then uh, characterised their gut bacterial communities, we find that these bees performing different behaviours also have differences in their, um, in their gut bacteria communities. 
and in particular, similar to the landscape observations, we find that they have differences in the relative abundance of some of the core bacterial taxa. So what do differences in the bacterial communities of bees performing different behaviours mean? Um, well, we know that the environment, things like the environment, diet and stress um, can affect the microbial community and that there is a bi-directional relationship between the gut bacteria community and the brain and that this in turn can affect the behaviour of the individuals. And then this feeds back into what sort of environment, what sort of diet and what sort of stress factors they are exposed to. So in this kind of feedback loop, this may be contributing to, to what sort of um, behaviours that are performed by different workers in a honeybee colony. So overall, what we find is that there's quite complex interactions between the environment, behaviour and gut bacteria communities of honeybees. So honeybee workers exposed to different landscape types harbour different bacterial communities, so different uh, relative abundances of some of the core bacterial taxa. And then we also find that honeybee workers performing different behaviours have differences in the relative abundance of some of the core bacterial taxa as well. So the next step was to find out uh, what else is important in the evolution of this highly social honeybee. And so recombination is likely an important mechanism in the evolution of social insects, including in the evolution of the highly social honeybee. Um, and you've just heard some interesting details a bit about this from Matt Webster, so I'll keep this part relatively short, but it's worth highlighting again that social insects have exceptionally high rates of crossing over, and the honeybee is known to have one of the highest recombination rates in any plant or animal. And these sort of elevated recombination rates are thought to be associated with the level of sociality in Hymenoptera more generally. However, the evolutionary causes of these extreme recombination rates are unknown, so here we wanted to really start to get at these kind of, these kind of uh, knowledge gaps. So what we did was we used whole genome resequencing of the social honeybee and compared that with the solitary leafcutter bee, Megachile rotundata. We estimated population scale recombination rates across regions and analysed factors that control recombination rate in these two bees. And what we find is that the average crossover rate is actually 24 times higher in the honeybee. So this confirms that recombination is extremely elevated in the honeybee. And that recombination rate, what we find is in the leafcutter bee, is in the range of sort of the majority of plants and animals. So the leafcutter bee, although it's just another bee, it has, it has a recombination rate that's more similar to something like a human than the highly social honeybee. And even with 100 million years divergence time between these two bee species and vastly different recombination rates, we find that there's similar underlying mechanisms modulating recombination rate variation in the genome. Both bee species show differences in recombination rate between different uh, genomic categories or regions. And as you can see here as an example from, for the solitary leafcutter bee, which also goes for the highly social honeybee, we find that there's a significantly lower recombination rate in coding regions compared with intronic and intergenic regions. And when we compare the recombination rate of autologous genes in the honeybee and leafcutter bee, we find that methylated genes have low recombination rate in both species. So therefore methylation uh, does appear to be a key factor um, in, in recombination rate variation. Interestingly, genes previously identified as social genes showed a significant but modest increase in recombination rate in the honeybee only. But what we find is that CPG class or methylation level had a larger effect on levels of sort of recombination rate variation than other factors such as these social, social genes. And elevated recombination rates do not appear to be restricted to hotspots in the genome for either bee species. So this means that ex the extreme recombination rates in the honeybee have most likely come about due to mechanisms that e increase recombination rate globally. So potentially selection could act on a major gene genetic modifier of recombination rate. And therefore there may be an advantage of higher recombination rate um, 
contributing to the diversity among workers in social insect colonies. So higher selection pr pressures in honeybees and social insects more generally may be dr driving this tremendous difference in genome-wide recombination rates. But exactly what this selection pressure is still needs to be determined. And in the next step, to help to address similar questions to those I've talked about today, as well as other interesting questions for the honeybee community, I helped to develop a SNP chip tool. And so, uh, so I briefly want to tell you about this, uh, this tool as well. So more generally, SNP chips offer a fast, accurate and efficient technique for genotyping thousands of polymorphisms in high numbers of individuals. So here we approach this by combining available information in genomic resources for the honeybee and using several selection criteria. And this enabled us to, to, to develop a, a SNP chip with over 100,000 SNPs. So we use genome resequencing of unrelated, uh, unrelated drones to detect many, many SNPs. We then reduce the number of SNPs that we wanted to include on the SNP chip by selecting specific SNPs. And you can see a sort of outline of this workflow here in this schematic diagram. So we included selecting SNPs in known existing key B genes um, and QTL studies. We included subspecies specific SNPs and also SNPs that were found to be specific to breeding objectives, including honey yield and gentleness. So in this way, we were able to develop a high density SNP chip for the honeybee that can be, use, can be a useful tool in a variety of, of different studies. This high density SNP chip can, for example, enable the detection of polymorphisms related to defenses against different pathogens, uh, the estimation of genetic variation in different honeybee subspecies and populations, GWAS of diverse traits, and probably also investigations of the genetic underpinnings of resistance to different stresses. So in summary, this work that I've discussed today highlights that a combination of different factors likely influences the evolution and maintenance of complex societies, such as that of the highly social honeybee. Now at UCD, where I started last year, I'll be building on this work with one major focus being conducting the National Apiculture Program. Now, now under this program, we are investigating what the major stresses are for honeybees on the island of Ireland and relating that to the geographic region and also to genomic, genomic variation. And with that, I'd like to thank all of my collaborators for their invaluable help and support with this work. And I'd also like to thank the different sequencing centers for their collaboration and support, as well as the different uh, funders for funding all this different work. And thank you very much for listening. Yeah, hello. Sorry, um, uh, earlier on my internet connection suddenly uh, busted completely. Uh, so thank you very much for a very nice talk. There's many different things uh, uh, you've been through in your career, starting from patch lines and gut and slip chips. I was just wondering, uh, um, you mentioned the fact that uh, the gut microbiota can have a, a profound effect on behavior, but also uh, you worked on you know, the genetic diversity of the bees. Don't you think there could be also a relation between the genetics of the bees themselves and the composition of the gut microbiota? Uh, yes, that, yes, I think I think that is um, that is likely, and I think there's been some some recent work um, also also sort of looking at this, looking at the relationship between uh, different individual bees and the sort of the gut microbiota, and also recognition cues, um, so particular hydrocarbons and uh, things like that. As I understand it, that's not work by myself, by but um, um, I think a postdoc working in um, um, Gene Robinson's lab, I think, uh, yeah, who's who's been working on that. So I think I think I think there is definitely the potential for that kind of sort of. But there's a whole lot of things interacting there. I guess is is what what I would say. Yeah, because I mean, couldn't an experiment like you did uh, by inseminating a, a queen just by one uh, male would be interested to go deeper into that sort of uh, investigations? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, interesting.
And uh, speaking about recombination, um, that there was one thing that strikes me is that uh, there seems to be no effect. I mean, the rec recombination doesn't seem to um, be higher in, in the regions in which uh, they have worker bias genes. Uh, usually, when people speak about CPG, um, genes which are higher in CPG content, these are mainly, um, 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 how, how do you call them? Uh, genes which are, you know, for. Uh, oh, Methylated, you mean? No, uh, general usage, you know, ubiquitous genes which are uh, for the maintenance, general maintenance of, uh, of, the, of the organism. Uh, would, would this mean that? These genes were predating the uh, appearance of sociality or uh, yeah. So that's I, I guess that's sort of I, mean, I think that hits the nail on the head in terms of what we were finding in that work comparing um, apes and mellifera to the to the solitary leafcutter bee. In that um, yeah, so worker worker genes or other genes, um, there is a sort of a elevated potentially an elevated recombination rate. In, in, in the honeybee to some extent, but then this is also also mirrored in you know similar genes in um, when we look at the same sort of genes or orthologous genes in in um, in the solitary leaf cutter bee. So it seems that yeah, the sort of either methylation level or other things are affecting that rather than rather than uh, selection on the um, on on those specific uh, selection for recombination in those specific genes. Yeah. Because uh, uh, the word I was looking for earlier on CPG uh, rich genes is more that there are housekeeping sorts of genes in, in, in general in other species. So this is why I was just wondering. Um, so I think. Yeah. yeah. So I guess we're going to move on to the next and last talk and we'll come back with more questions for you to, yeah, uh, during the general discussion. Thank you very much for your presentation. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so our uh, last presenter is Amro Zayed. He's a York, chair, York Research Chair in Genomics. He leads a team of scientists that studies the evolutionary, behavioral, and conservation genomics of social insects using the honeybee as a model organism. In 2019 and 2020, he served as a, the elected president of the Entomological Society of Ontario and is currently the director of York's University Center for Bee Ecology, Evolution and Conservation. He has been involved in large projects across Canada and is now one of the leader of the BCSI project. And today he will tell us more about this project and uh, that aims at finding biomarkers for bee health to develop a diagnostic tool. And now let's go for Amro's presentation. Hello, my name is Amro Zaid uh, from York University. Today I'm going to tell you about a fun project we're starting here in Canada called uh, BCSI. Uh, it's a set of tools for diagnosing why bee uh, colonies are declining. Uh, before I start, I just want to quickly uh, introduce my lab. This is a picture taken before COVID. Uh, we're at York University in Toronto uh, and uh, we have always looking for talented postdocs. So if you're interested in, in joining the lab, please do uh, send me an email. Uh, all right, so uh, we're going to start with the slide, which is a survey taken from Canadian beekeepers uh, in, uh, uh, from 2024, uh, sorry, 2014 to 2016. Uh, and we essentially asked beekeepers why they thought their colonies died. And let's say about 7% uh, of them, uh, of beekeepers said that they don't know why their colonies have died. Uh, but uh, the kind of uh, two of the biggest issues that people point to are uh, queen issues and weak fall hives. Uh, so these are the bars right here and, and right here. And uh, these are actually kind of symptoms of a, a sick colony, right? Uh, uh, queens just don't die on their own. There's often, I mean, they do when they age up, uh, but we've been noticing in, in Canada and many parts of the world that uh, queens are essentially dying much earlier than they used to. Uh, and uh, similarly with like weak fall hives, that, that's a symptom of a stressed colony. Uh, and so if you combine these uh, uh, unknown weak fall hives and queen issues, it ends up that beekeepers are essentially unable to account for about a half of the colonies uh, when they die. And uh, this is kind of what inspired our project is, is can we easily detect the stressors affecting a honeybee colony before it dies, uh, allowing beekeepers to enact management practices that would recover health and, and, and ideally save a colony. 
And uh, we, uh, we have some uh, preliminary data uh, generated by our group, but also others that suggest that we could use uh, expression biomarkers to predict uh, stressors in, in a specific manner. Uh, so this lovely figure is from uh, uh, Duplay et al, uh, a, a review in uh, BMC Genomics published in 2017, where they, I think, analyzed about uh, 17 or 20 different uh, expression studies uh, where bees were subjected to infections and, and gene expression was uh, studied with uh, uh, microarrays or, or uh, RNA sequencing. And uh, what uh, they have here is a pathway of uh, what you're seeing is a genetic pathway, uh, the toll pathway, and the IMN, IMD, GMK pathway. These are genes. You have your uh, kind of uh, recognition molecules here, uh, your signaling molecules, and that leads to uh, the cell uh, producing uh, antimicrobial peptides. And so uh, what, uh, what you're looking at here is uh, the, the colors represent whether you have no differential expression based on infection. So this is in white. Uh, you have the light yellow. These are genes that are differentially expressed in the presence of all pathogens. Uh, here, all pathogens being uh, either Nosema, uh, Varroa mites, and, and some of the viruses that they uh, vector. So light, light uh, yellow, uh, meaning uh, expression, differential expression, uh, regardless of what the pathogen is. Uh, but then we do have some uh, stressor-specific uh, expression. So uh, let's say uh, this uh, darker orange uh, are differentially expressed in the presence of uh, Nosema. Uh, so that's uh, like uh, DNR1 uh, and uh, uh, Defensin1, for example. And then the dark or the, the brown color here, these are genes that are differentially expressed only in the presence of uh, varroa mites and, and uh, the viruses that the, the mites vector. Uh, so uh, based on this study, it, it does suggest that, okay, there, uh, uh, there are, by studying gene expression, we can essentially predict what stressors are affecting a colony. So if, if we found in, in, in a honeybee colony in, in workers that relish is, is overexpressed, that suggests that uh, bees are being infected by varroa and virus. And if we find defense in one being overexpressed, that suggests that Nosema is, is infecting uh, the colony. So uh, immune gene expression is essentially predicting infection status here. Uh, we uh, did some similar experiments looking at uh, how exposure to agrochemicals influences gene expression in, in high workers and whether we could use that expression pattern to, uh, to predict uh, what bees are being exposed to in the, in the wild. Uh, so uh, the right panel here, uh, the left panel, <laughs> uh, panel A, what, let's just call it panel A, is a heat map of uh, a gene expression study where we took honeybee workers and exposed them to a pesticide called clothianidin. It's a neonicotinoid uh, uh, pesticide that is commonly used in, uh, throughout the, um, pretty much uh, the, the entire world. And uh, what you're seeing here is about uh, 40, I think 43 genes that are differentially like regulated uh, in the honeybee brain after exposure to uh, clothianidin. Uh, you have genes going uh, up in exposed bees and, and, and down in unexposed bees and vice versa. Some genes are going down in exposed bees and, 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 and uh, have higher expression in unexposed bees. Uh, so uh, based on this small study, we, we also found data uh, on three other pesticides, imidacloprid, which is another neonicotinoids, and cumafos and fluvalinate, which are uh, miticides that are commonly used in, 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 to control uh, mites and honeybee colonies. And they were also based on RNA sequencing. And we just uh, to kind of explore whether there's going to be a lot of overlap in differential gene expression, we just did this Venn diagram. So it's showing you the overlap in differential gene expression across these four molecules. And uh, to, uh, uh, in, in every single case for, for every one of these pesticides, there is a, a fairly large number of genes that are uniquely expressed, differentially expressed in the presence of that compound and not any of the other pesticides. So for example, out of the 329 uh, differentially expressed genes in the metacloprate study, uh, 289 were unique to metacloprate and not uh, differentially expressed with clothianidin, and fumafos, and fluvalinate. 
Similarly, uh, almost all of the genes in our clothianidin study, the 44 in the differentially expressed genes from uh, the clothianidin study, uh, 38 of them are uniquely differentially expressed when bees are exposed to clothianidin. Uh, 393 of, uh, out of the 507 genes that are upregulated in the Kumapas study were unique to Kumapas. And uh, 79 out of 165 genes that were differentially regulated uh, by tau fluval uh, fluvalinate uh, were unique to that molecule. So again, uh, we're, we're seeing this pattern that uh, gene expression, at least for some genes, are, is predicting pesticide exposure. So uh, you could, based on the pattern of the fingerprint that exposure to a pesticide leaves on a bee brain, you can predict the actual compound that the bee is being exposed to. So this inspired us to develop uh, this project called uh, BCSI. Uh, which involves a very large uh, community of uh, Canadian uh, bee researchers. We have, uh, 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 let's see here, uh, well, it's, it's hard to pick out all, <laughs> all the people, but uh, we have essentially colleagues from the University of British Columbia, Dr. Leonard Foster and, and his group, uh, several uh, researchers from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, uh, Dr. Steve Purnell, Dr. Martha Guarna, uh, Dr. Shelley Hoover from uh, uh, Lethbridge, uh, Dr. Rob Curry from uh, Manitoba, Dr. Ernesto Guzman from the University of Guelph, and Dr. Pierre Giovanazzo from uh, the University of Laval. Uh, so we a very large uh, group, and uh, what we're essentially planning to do is carry out a set of uh, large-scale experiments to develop uh, biomarkers to assess bee health. Uh, the goal of the project is to develop a technology that kind of looks like this. That this is visualized with old microarray pictures, but obviously we, we plan to do this with that answer technique. But the basic idea is we want to develop a set of tools so that way beekeepers could uh, collect uh, workers from their colony, uh, bring them to a service center, uh, run some uh, expression, gene expression, protein expression, and, and actually got microbiome profiling and, and look for some specific biomarkers that would then provide a diagnosis of the stressors infecting this, this colony. Uh, and that will in turn allow beekeepers, uh, once they know what's stressing on their bees, to enact appropriate management to kind of uh, uh, reduce the uh, infections or, or in the case of uh, uh, pesticides, uh, move colonies, relocate them to uh, areas that uh, experience less agrochemical pressures. Uh, but the idea is that the tools are providing a diagnosis that allows the beekeeper to manage colony in a way to prevent decline before it's too late. So uh, the, the way we plan to achieve this is uh, a very uh, large number of experiments where it, we're essentially taking honeybees and exposing, exposing them to relevant stressors and measuring uh, gene expression uh, through RNA sequencing, uh, measuring protein expression uh, 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 using proteomics, and measuring changes in the gut microbiome of, uh, of uh, the, the workers. Uh, so the, the, essentially, the, the basic principles for this is we have, uh, th this is from a review uh, with uh, uh, Professor Christina Grosinger and, and myself uh, published uh, in uh, 2020 in, in uh, uh, Nature Reviews uh, Genetics. Uh, so we have a, a control uh, bee population and we have bees stressed with uh, viruses, uh, bees stressed with, uh, sorry, uh, bees stressed with uh, uh, viral mite infection, uh, bees stressed with uh, viral uh, uh, virus uh, be stressed with pesticide exposure and be stressed by poor nutrition. Uh, we do our uh, transcriptomics. We identify genes that are upregulated or downregulated for each single one of these stressors. And we do this for a very large number of stressors. And through the process of subtraction, we're then able to identify stressor specific biomarkers as well as general uh, uh, stressor, general uh, biomarkers that indicate stress. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, we'll, if we look at this gene list here, so uh, bees exposed to varroa mites. Uh, this this is obviously a cartoon, so uh, it, it's uh, it's uh, hypothetical. Uh, so, uh, you know, we'll we'll just say when bees exposed to mites, we see upregulation of gene one, five, ten, thirteen, and twenty-four. Uh, bees exposed to a virus, we see upregulation of gene one, ten, fifteen, twenty-four, twenty-eight. And then, you know, we get these gene lists and then we compare them. And after comparing them, we find that, okay, well, for varroa mite infected bees, gene five is, is uh, although we have several genes that go up, uh, gene five and gene 13 are the only ones that go up with the presence of varroa, but not any of these other uh, uh, stressors. Uh, 
So that that this process of uh, doing many experiments and then subtracting up what's common and what's unique allows us to get the stressor spe uh, specific biomarkers as well as the more general uh, biomarkers for stress. Uh, so uh, we we plan to do uh, a lot of these experiments uh, with cage bees. So we we bring bees, uh, put them in a cage, and we introduce stressors in in, in a controlled manner to allow us to uh, essentially get cause and effect type uh, reasoning. Uh, with the setup, uh, most of the time we are essentially sampling nurse bees and we are setting up cages, uh, a lot of randomizing them into control and, and treatment. Uh, and then we're measuring uh, our, once the once exposure period is done, we're taking the bees, extracting uh, RNA protein in the microbiome. Uh, the tissues that were uh, for the RNA and the pro proteomics, we're doing uh, three tissues. We're doing the head, which is, you know, brain, a lot of the nervous system. So, uh, Stressors that affect the nervous system and, and, and neurobiology will be, we're, we're likely to pick them up in the head. Uh, we're also then dissecting out the abdomen and separating the midgut from the abdomen, and we're analyzing the midgut on its own, as well as the abdomen on its own, uh, the midgut as well as the malfusion tubes. So that allows us to assay tissues that are involved in, uh, in metabolism uh, and detoxification and, and then uh, look at how each of these tissues uh, allows us to. Uh, uh, detect biomarkers relating to either like changes in neurobiology, uh, changes in metabolism, or, or, or uh, changes associated with detoxifying or dealing with uh, pesticide exposure. Uh, some of these experiments we, we are doing in colonies. So here the setup is we standardize colonies uh, before the experiment, we allocate them to control and treatment, and then uh, subject them to the experimental uh, stressor, uh, sample nurses, uh, then do the omics on the back end for marker discovery. Uh, these are the list of stressors that we're we're planning to test. Uh, so you know some of them, you know, common obvious ones: uh, the mites, Nosema, uh, deformed brain virus, deformed brain virus A and B, Israeli acute paralysis virus. Uh, uh, we are we conducted experiments on both the and clamatoxin, two common agrochemicals used in Canada, as well as uh, Oxytet, which is an antibacterial. Uh, uh, antibiotic that is used uh, on uh, honeybees to treat uh, American uh, fowl brood. Uh, we also did American fowl brood, a bacterial disease, uh, chalk brood, uh, kind of a fungal brood Paris, uh, disease, uh, as well as we're looking at the effects of uh, diet restriction and pollen diversity, uh, pollen restriction and pollen, uh, pollen diversity. Uh, this year, we're, we're actually testing uh, 15 common and emerging agrochemicals that we detected uh, in uh, 2020 in, in natural colonies in Canada. Uh, and then we are also planning to deal with interaction. So uh, after uh, next year, we are planning to test the 10 most common two-way stressor combinations. Obviously, you know, uh, bees are not exposed to stressors one at a time. Often it's done in combination. And we did want to explore how this kind of uh, uh, potential synergistic interaction between, uh, between common stressors could lead to uh, uh, the novel biomarkers. Uh, so uh, that activity one is our kind of cause and effect manipulation where we're taking bees and exposing them to uh, stressors in, in a controlled way and, and measuring gene expression. Uh, but we also are doing uh, studies in the field. Uh, essentially, we're, we're placing colonies in, in areas where they experience gradients of stress. Uh, so uh, what we typically do is we uh, take bees uh, at the start, we take about 40 colonies at the start of the year. Uh, for every kind of uh, region, and we randomly allocate them to apiaries that are either close to a crop, here supplies by corn, or far away from a crop. Uh, these colonies are tracked uh, for the period, uh, period of time that represents either uh, kind of chronic exposure, so field long uh, 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 time frame, or for pollination, you know, if the beekeeper is essentially putting their colonies near a crop for uh, three weeks or four weeks. Uh, then, uh, then we follow them over that four week period. Uh, we uh, get a measure uh, at time point one, right when the colonies were randomized, a measure at time point two, uh, representing peak, expo peak exposure. So that would be when most of the flowers are in bloom. Uh, and then at time point three is when the colonies are moved away from the crop. Uh, and every uh, one of these time points, we do a full uh, pesticide screen, uh, look for uh, over 220 different agrochemicals. We test for pests and pathogens. And we're also collecting the pollen uh, uh, that the bees bring back to the colony to do a, a 
pollen uh, metagenomic analysis to essentially molecularly identify the pollen that bees are bringing in. Uh, and uh, this experiment, uh, the purpose of this experiment is, is several fold. Uh, so uh, before I tell you what the purpose is, I'll, uh, let me just tell you where the crop systems that we're uh, studying are. So we're uh, doing apple. Uh, these are all like fairly common crops in, in Canada. Uh, we're studying two types of canola, canola oil, that's the crop used to produce the oil, as well as the crop used to produce the seed to plant the canola that is then producing the oil. Uh, we're studying colonies near corn and near cranberry, hibiscus blueberry, lupus blueberry, as well as in uh, soybeans. And uh, yeah, essentially, uh, these colonies are uh, are sampled fairly regularly. This is an example of us collecting nectar for pesticide anal analysis from the comb, as well as sampling the pollen collecting uh, collected by honeybees uh, uh, in the actual colony. So the, the purpose of this is uh, twofold. One is we are using this to kind of validate the markers we discovered from activity one. So for example, in our cause of effect experiment, uh, let's say we treated uh, bees uh, to a five parts per billion per million of a, a pesticide. And we found that, okay, we have a marker, gene A, uh, it goes down in expression and exposed bees. Well, uh, based on our data from activity two, we could subset all of the colonies that exposed five parts per million of that pesticide and compare them to colonies that, where we didn't detect that pesticide. And we could ask, okay, does gene A still track exposure like it did in activity one? So if uh, gene A goes down in the natural colonies exposed to five parts per million of pesticide, uh, then we could say, okay, yes, this marker is, is uh, validated from our field studies. Uh, we're also using the, uh, the correlation structure in the data set uh, to detect additional markers. So, uh, you know, imagine we have all of these colonies across Canada where we have known levels of pesticides, pathogens, et cetera. Uh, we could correlate these differences bet uh, between colonies in, in, in a specific stressor uh, against our gene expression data and essentially look for, uh, uh, look for genes whose expression co-varies with a specific uh, a stressor. So an example, you know, gene C might, uh, uh, might track uh, exposure to a specific pesticide or gene B here might uh, be tracking the form with uh, wing virus copies in, in our columns. So uh, activity two is essentially used to uh, validate the cause and effect experiments, but also detect uh, new uh, and new biomarkers that are correlating with the specific stressors that we actually quantify in, in our colonies. Uh, the last part of, uh, of our project, which I think we're, we're really excited about, is we're, we're uh, collaborating with the Ontario Beekeepers Association in Ontario to actually do a pilot project where we're sampling uh, bee, actual beekeepers colonies uh, over four years. Uh, the first two years, we're, we're uh, applying the typical diagnostics that beekeepers have access to now, and, QPCR for uh, looking for viruses, doing like mite shakes and, and that sort of thing. And then as we develop the uh, biomarkers, the genomic biomarkers, we're going to switch from doing the diagnostics with the traditional bi uh, the, uh, the traditional tools to these new uh, omic tools, and then ask whether that actually results in any uh, tangible uh, improvement in how beekeepers uh, manage their colonies and, and ultimately what, whether beekeepers that use omic tools are, are going to be in a better off position financially uh, uh, relative to the beekeepers that are using your, your typical traditional diagnostic tools. And you know, through all of this work, we hope to have this, uh, uh, this platform uh, ready for use in, in, uh, in about uh, you know, three, three years uh, approximately. And, and, uh, and we have several uh, service centers that uh, we're, will essentially be offering this uh, biomarker testing services to the Canadian community. Uh, so uh, that's it. I just want to acknowledge uh, sources of funding, uh, Genome Canada, Ontario Genomics, uh, uh, the Ontario Ministry of Research and Innovation, which actually just changed its name to the Ontario Ministry of uh, Colleges and Universities, uh, Genome British Columbia, as well as uh, Genome Quebec. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Yes, uh, Thank you very much, Amru. That was a great talk, and it's impressive uh, the large projects you managed to get going in Canada. I think I saw another project uh, in some other conferences about uh, varroa mites and things like that. I was just wondering uh, how you manage to integrate uh, data for such from such diverse sources. I mean, the, you've got diverse research labs, and then the field experiments. Do you involve commercial breeders for that, or is it? Are you, 
only universities and is it you know all throughout canada and canada is pretty big seen from europe yeah it, it, it is uh, it is almost all of canada we we are missing uh, the east coast uh but uh it essentially involves kind of quebec all the way uh <laughs> almost atlantic all the way to the pacific uh, it, it it requires a lot of work and a lot of obviously coordination and organization. So we, we the whole team meets uh, uh, once uh, on on Zoom every every week, and we're always kind of discussing plan and coordinating things. The, the amount of coordination is just unbelievable. Uh, but again, I'm I'm really fortunate to to have uh, uh, all of these really really amazing uh, researchers and 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 people with diverse skills. Uh, so to specifically answer your question, most of the time we're we're actually uh, we're we're working with research uh, researchers that uh, keep uh, honeybees and and and, uh, and we're using uh, their colonies uh, for some experiments. We are using uh, bee, uh, beekeepers colonies, uh, but uh, most of them are I would call kind of academic colonies that are kind of standardized uh, using uh, typical ways uh, honeybee biologists kind of uh, deal with and, and standardize honeybee colonies and. Uh, and manage them in a way to create these uh, controlled experiments. It's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, because I would think there would be some um, standardization issues. I mean, people don't always work the same way and vocabulary and all that sort of thing. Yeah. We, we, we spend about uh, I, about eight months actually developing standardized procedures and, and uh, uh, so we we have like a, we, uh, by by the way if you're if you're ever thinking about developing something this great the, there's a, a, a software called Slack uh, which is super useful to allow kind of different teams to to collaborate it's yeah. way more efficient than email but yeah so we 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 spend a lot of time coming up with standardized protocols uh, we we do we did actually want to do things in different places so every stressor that we're testing uh, is done in at least two different places in Canada and that's because we. Uh, we, we're obviously, you know, bees differ in, in, in their genetics from, from place to place and the environment plays an effect, obviously, and, and we wanted our, the biomarkers to kind of be robust. Uh, so we, we didn't want all like the Varroa experiments to be done in Toronto, because that way, you know, our markers tracking Varroa or they're tracking, you know, Varroa in Toronto. Uh, so uh, we intentionally spread out the experiments across, uh, across Canada to kind of uh, 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 introduce some of the geogra this geographic variation and, and, and have our markers be robust to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some people make up specific ontologies to make sure that they're speaking about the same thing. Um, well, speaking about large omic uh, stuff, um, I have a question. Well, I have. <laughs> uh, it's more about uh, the um, genomic tip. I don't think now we're going to ask questions or have a general debate uh, with uh, all three uh, presenters. Uh, so thank you very much for all your presentations. Uh, great. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, the SNP chip uh, that was developed, um, has it been tested much? Because you, you, you spoke about the, the selection of markers that were done using different subspecies, but how many subspecies were included and how well does it work in the real world? Do you have any insights on that? Um, yeah, so, so yes, it's, it hasn't been, um, I think it hasn't been tested in terms of how well it, how well it um, detects different subspecies as yet, but um, different SNPs were selected both from the literature and in this sequencing, at least two different subspecies to, to include SNPs that can potentially be useful for that, so. And I just mentioned that that um, actually now there is a project that's that's ongoing um, with this the Institute for Bee Research in Berlin, where they are combining this SNP chip that we uh, that is already developed um, with with other results from the um, um, from from a, from another project to make a sort of a, an even more perhaps comprehensive SNP chip, and that and that. The, the idea is that that will be available um, from autumn this year. So, um, and that's led by Casper Bienefeld from um, the Bee Research Institute in Berlin. Yeah, well, he was involved in both projects, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, speaking about diversity in subspecies, I don't know if you have 
so much of a debate on that in Canada or in the US, but in, in Europe, in France, anyhow, there's always that debate between people who uh, believe in the black bee, which is supposed to be the original bee in Western Europe, and the uh, yellow bee imported from Italy or other places. Uh, oh yeah, that's highly topical in Ireland because the um, the native Irish black bee is, you know, the favoured bee by the, the statistics supposedly is about 90% of beekeepers in Ireland. So they are really, there's the Native Irish Honey Bee Society, which is, you know, so that, so it's basically trying to conserve apes mellifera mellifera that is um, thought to be the native subspecies to Ireland and, and potentially a, a bit divergent more from continental Europe mellifera mellifera. So um, yeah, it's very topical here. Yeah. What about Canada? Yeah, for, for, for us, it's uh, it's not a big deal because all all of our bees are are kind of highly admixed, and uh, and uh, uh, we import about a third of our colonies from outside of Canada every year. So it's like a huge amount of gene flow that just homo homogenizes everything. So uh, <laughs> that we we don't really worry too much about uh, using specific uh, uh, kind of subspecies or or protecting specific subspecies of honeybees. Yeah, but with the imports be always, um, you know. Uh, the same because in France, when you speak with uh, bee breeders, you know, sometimes there's a fashion to have bees from Caucasia or from Italy or from Slovenia or different places. And it's re it gets into, yeah, as you say, it's sort of homogeneous, but it gets to some sort of nightmare. We actually just uh, discussed there in our journal club uh, uh, a paper on about Darwinian beekeeping and, and the importance of like using bees that are locally adapted uh, to the environment, and it, it it does it does make sense to obviously use uh, uh, use subspecies or and genotypes that that do well in your environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and by the way, uh, there have been some questions in the chat that may have been answered uh, by. Um, Typing, but if uh, any of you, uh, Matt, who, Julia, or Amaro, find that there's some interesting ones to specifically address, uh, well, please do. Um, uh, for instance, uh, I don't know, Matt, there was a question about the differences between European and African bees. Uh, do you have an idea how it happens that recombination rates could be so different between? Uh, on different continents? Um, well, I, those differences are, are not significant because we didn't have very high samples from the African bees, but uh, um, assuming they are, then uh, there are definitely quite big differences between uh, African and European colonies uh, in terms of uh, the number of drones they produce, um, uh, the size of the colonies and uh, I mean, a lot of other aspects. So uh, I think uh, um, it wouldn't necessarily be that surprising to see uh, significant uh, differences between African and European bees. I think uh, um, one, one thing that uh, hasn't, I guess people quite often think of the, the fact that, the, 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 that uh, youth social insects have large colonies of sterile workers as being the main, uh, um, their main characteristic that, that might be related to recombination, but there are also other factors. I mean, another, another factor is that there's quite a big um, kind of sex bias in, in offspring. So, I mean, the honeybee colony produces uh, um, a few queens but uh, many, many drones. So there's sort of many more males and those males are all haploid, which uh, creates a, a different uh, environment for selection because uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, deleterious uh, um, variants are exposed, deleterious recessive variants. So uh, I think uh, there's a, a lot of uh, kind of interesting, uh, Evolutionary forces that are, are that, that are likely to be uh, different in uh, in use of insects, and and also those things differ between uh, even between subspecies in, in terms of like sex biases and uh, um, uh, no, such things. Uh, uh, did you mention uh, 
comparing the size of the colonies, you said that they uh, size of colonies can vary, but is there a correlation mm -hmm. between the size of the colonies and recombination rate? Um, not that we've not that we've seen so far, because I think so far we have uh, um, not enough data. Okay, so, so I mean that within species, of course. Mm. Okay, and um, there was a question in the in the chat about uh, have you looked at anything else than uh, CPG methylation and expression data, and that uh, strikes me another question. Your hypothesis seems to be that the, in honeybee it doesn't go uh, towards hotspots like in species with uh, PRGA9, but there could be some other genes having the same sort of effect. You mean it's more a question of open chromatin sort of thing? Yeah, I mean that's that's one one aspect. I mean the I guess the 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 factor that we've identified that seems to uh, correlate the, the strongest is, uh, is this uh, CPG observed over expected, which is a, uh, um, which is a, a fairly good measure of germline uh, recombination. And it, that, so, I mean, uh, and, and it, in honeybees, you have uh, methylation in genes, which also have lower recombination rates and and there's variation in the levels of methylation between genes, which also seems to uh, track uh, recombination variation. Yeah, I was just wondering, while we're speaking, uh, suddenly there's no recombination in males. So could we consider as a species that the recombination rate is 26, or do we have to divide by two in terms of you know, the way that things are shuffled from one generation to the next? Uh, well, I guess there are other species where, uh, well, Drosophila um, yeah. are the same. The recombination doesn't occur in males either. Um, okay. Um, uh, well, thank you very much, um, uh, Amro, uh, Julia. Any questions in the chat that you found interesting? Um, I think there was one about how well uh, things correlate between um, lab experiments and field experiments in which the concentrations of pesticides are not the same. Uh, there could be some long-term effects. I, I mean, have you thought about looking at, at uh, you know, long-term effects with low doses? And you did mention doing you know two pesticides at the time but yeah, uh, we we uh, we, uh, we uh, did uh, we did uh, deal with uh, with uh, this uh, this question of like how, how much to treat these and and essentially uh, I, I i went through the project so fast but uh, we have a very large experiment that was done in the field near crops and we were able to quantify the concentration of 220 different pesticides so we know what field realistic is because we measured it in our colonies uh, uh, in uh, last year. Uh, so for uh, for all of the chemicals where where we're testing, uh, we are essentially using uh, two different uh, field realistic levels: uh, average and something that is a little bit kind of more extreme. Uh, and for the systemic insecticides like like neonicotinoids, where where they do accumulate and and they can bees are can be exposed chronically. Uh, so for the systemic insecticides that we're testing, uh, we are also adding, we're doing kind of a uh, acute sublethal as well as uh, average chronic exposure from our field data. Uh, so we, we, we feel like obviously, yeah, we, we uh, the, the critique on, on this, let's feed pesticides uh, to a bee in a cage has always been, well, you know, did you feed them the right amount? And, and did you feed them for the right time? And I think we we have uh, we we waited to do most of the agrochemicals this year because we wanted to use last year's field data uh, to be able uh, to parameterize the, the, ex the exposure. Yeah, and there was a more practical question also uh, about uh, RNA studies. I mean, um, how do you handle the samples in a practical way when working with beekeepers, uh, professionals? Because RNA degrades, right? Yeah, yeah, and uh, that that, that's a, that was an excellent question from uh, Yves Lacant, um, and uh, 
we uh, uh, beekeepers already we we we've, we've set up this kind of pipeline that already exists. There, there's a place called the National Bee Diagnostic Center. Uh, it's in Alberta, and, uh, and beekeepers do send samples for uh, kind of qPCR uh, analysis of uh, pathogens. And so the, the, the system of essentially ordering dry ice, which is fairly easy to, uh, to get a, a hold of. Uh, so uh, beekeepers would order a small batch of dry ice, sample the colonies, and then, and then ship them to uh, the service center for uh, uh, RNA extraction and testing. Uh, what we're trying to do is uh, see whether we could optimize this a little bit and perhaps replace dry ice with uh, something like RNA later ice. Uh, and uh, I, I, I was <laughs> texting with other people that are attending the talk, and uh, I think that there was a, a Brock suggested the possibility. Uh, Brock Harper at uh, Purdue suggested the possibility of doing these uh, like in the field tests, and I have no idea what what's involved, but I was like, yeah, that that would be awesome. So. <laughs> So uh, right now, I think we, uh, it's not a big deal to use dry ice for beekeepers that, because it's, it's fairly, it's really readily available even uh, for the public. Uh, uh, there, there's enough people like brewing beer at home and, <laughs> and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, RNA later ice would, would make things a little bit easier, maybe more expensive, but a little bit easier and, and potentially something uh, like on the field test would, would, be, uh, would be super. Yeah, because you mentioned the cost. Sometimes you get into those projects in which you cut down on the costs of, you know, the lab work, and suddenly you find yourself with very high costs of unexpected ones, like, 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 like what you just mentioned. Yeah. In your study, I was quite impressed of, uh, you know, how you could find some um, differentially expressed genes, which were specific to some specific pesticide. But in fact, I was even more impressed by the fact that none or hardly any were common. So even as low as two pesticides, have you got any comments on that? Yeah, yeah. So I, I, th I think, uh, I think that we we saw, I, I believe we saw more in common between the two immunocannabinoid insecticides. Uh, I think I'm I'm not entirely surprised that there wasn't a big overlap between the mitocides and the uh, neonicotinoids because they're essentially different molecules. Like, I mean, they, they, they work in a, in a very different way. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of why, uh, why, why we think that we, when, we, when we designed this experiment, obviously there, there is some data that shows that uh, with, with the gene expression work with immunity that you can have stressors with specific biomarkers uh, for if you, if you, I think the specificity comes from kind of two things. Uh, one is, is that the, the stressors are are um, uh, are targeting kind of different pathways or, or different cells, uh, but also that the symptoms that the uh, the, the stressors cause in bees differ. So I, I think the combination of these two gives us some uh, some specificity. Now I, I'll say that you know. The, <laughs> we've, we've done four chemicals now. So we, we, the more the more experiments you do, right? By by definition, the less <laughs> your your unique genes are going to get smaller and smaller. So uh, we 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 hope to get to a place that once we have all of our you know 20, 30 different stressors, that we're still going to have something unique, or, or at least that we could have specific groups of stressors that are that are this unique. So. Maybe the neonicotinoid insecticides will leave a unique signature that is different from uh, the pyrethroids, that is different from uh, a herbicide, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, Marcel, you raised up. Uh, is that a question? Yeah to do with that just with this sort of diagnostic it sounds really amazing but what is your vision for you know including the rest of the world can i tell them <laughs> send their samples from ireland they would love it I, I i think i think like so long as the genotypes uh, are similar uh then then do you would kind of expect uh, some uh, some crossover uh with you know with, with sufficient validation and so on so yeah we, we let's have a conversation julie <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so in Ireland, you would be like in France, perhaps uh, genotypes would be that similar if we're interested in black bees. Yeah, well, um, we're going to have a bit of a, a more of a look at that. There has been quite a bit of work done on that. And, you know, anecdotally, at least for the campus reporting, there is, yeah, mostly, it seems, apes mellifera, but of course, there are beekeepers also 
uh, importing bees too. There's yeah. buckfast bees, there's canica, there's lagustica. So to a lesser extent, and perhaps they don't mention it as much because it's a bit unpopular. So we'll see. Yeah. Uh, I see you raised hand. Yeah, you uh, um, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I did. I I had a question for for Amro as well. I was wondering what uh, kind of what you would envision envisage as the kind of final product of this. If you, I mean, could can you make a like a a, a quick and cheap assay that would that would uh, survey the the genes you find that you could kind of quickly use to test the hive. Yeah, we, 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 we have, uh, once we actually have a, a list of markers, and so keep in mind that we have the transcriptomics, and we have proteomics, and we have uh, changes in the gut microbiome, and so everyone will, will, will require slightly different uh, uh, instrumentation to kind of assay. Uh, so we'll, we'll essentially do an exercise of, of, uh, uh, of figuring out what, what, what are the most robust markers in terms of like uh, predictive value and, and uh, like type one, type two errors and, and that sort of thing. Uh, I think right now, uh, like just short term, we're essentially planning to, uh, to test uh, the biomarkers in the same way that they were discovered. So sequencing uh, for, uh, uh, for transcriptomics, uh, 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 barcoding, uh, meta barcoding for uh, gut microbiome and, and, and proteomics. Uh, so uh, we, we, we are collaborating with the National Bee Diagnostic Center and, and they have essentially the instrumentation uh, to do this. Uh, so uh, short term, we're, we're testing in the same way as things were discovered. Obviously, there, there'll be a lot of room to then uh, develop the technology further, miniaturize it, and, and obviously like uh, in the field testing would, would be ideal. Uh, where uh, part of this Genome Canada project involves a whole other uh, group of researchers uh, that are economists and, and modelers. And, and, and there have been uh, numerous surveys of beekeepers about how much money they spend on diagnostics, how much money they're willing to spend. So that a whole bunch of people that are crunching numbers and, and, and will figure out what's, what's the sweet spot. What, you know. but obviously, we, we don't want to create a technology that is so expensive that nobody will use mm. it. That, that would just... Yeah. So we, we are going to try to optimize it to, uh, uh, to, uh, to make it uh, in a way that will, uh, we hope, allow mass adaptation so that way beekeepers look at this solution, uh, look at this technology as a really viable solution, especially around like a key, uh, key time points in, in beekeeping, right? When early in the spring, when you're building up and in the fall before, uh, as you or prepare the colonies for winter, these are kind of key time points that you could uh, effectively implement treatments and, and and, and improve the health of your colony going into either pollination or, or the winter. So uh, we, we hope to at least optimize a pipeline where beekeepers could send samples and get back an answer within a, a week so that way they, they could uh, manage, manage things. I was also just um, one, one other quick thing. Have you, uh -huh. have you, um, have you thought about uh -huh. or have you, uh -huh. tried, have you tried using these uh, um, AI methods to uh, identify varroa mites. Uh, uh, are the, the, like from a picture? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we 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 actually we we're, we're, we actually are trying to pilot that. We have lots of uh, pictures of brood comb. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we I, I I haven't like I haven't gotten an answer about how well it works. <laughs> no. it, it's on uh, one of my postdocs. Uh, well, actually, no, it's a former PhD student that is uh, working on it. Uh, but uh, hmm. I think I think I think like get, getting getting inf quick information from images of bee colonies that would just open up a whole uh, hmm. new amount like a lot of data that we can get for people that do genomics and transcriptomics. Uh, high hmm. throughput phenotyping would, would just be amazing for us. Um, Julia, maybe I have a question for you. Uh, I'm really interested in your in uh, your experiment on the patchy lines. And I was wondering, because you looked at a really specific task of fanning, uh, I, I wondered if you observed the same impact uh, of patchy lines on other tasks, for example, like boot carrying or hygiene or things like that, or if you've looked into that at all, or if you have any uh, ideas or comments on, on that. And uh, yeah, 
Uh, yeah, well, I think it's a pretty uh, a pretty general sort of phenomenon to have different thresholds for different patrol lines because there's been previous work by other people, um, you know, quite some years ago looking at looking at, for example, um, threshold for collecting pollen and like high pollen hoarding strains, low pollen hoarding strains. So um, that those kinds of thresholds for collecting that do do appear, do appear to sort of be associated with genotype for those those kinds of things. Yeah. Okay, and, and I mean, um, for example, yeah, like I guess the short story is sort of not. There's a couple of levels here. I don't think it's a, it's specific to one task. It's a, then it's also between tasks. Like so, different yeah. patterns might have different thresholds for doing thermoregulating compared to doing foraging or 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 so on. And then then there's also the age factor as well. So with many things, I guess. Okay. <laughs> task allocation. Sorry. Task allocation. Yeah, yeah. task allocation. <laughs> Um, and uh, yeah, sorry, I don't want to. Uh, Moro, I was wondering, you, you mentioned mostly that you worked on nurses in your lab experiment. Are you going to work on other casts of individual or only in the fields? Then are you? Yeah, we we uh, we had we had a, a lively debate about uh, uh, with with the team about wh which bees to kind of focus on, and and we thought nurses were a good cast because uh, uh, they're kind of you know easily they're an easily defined group of bees that uh, could be sampled easily, and then if you think about what what nurses do in a colony, uh, they kind of potentially integrate the nutritional stressors, uh, the agrochemical stressors and, and the pathogenic. So there, there's kind of the key, the key hub that uh, takes brood, uh, takes food collected by foragers, uh, synthesize it uh, to, uh, uh, to produce brood food and then feed all the workers. So they're, they're, they're a key link in, in the honeybee colony. They interact with foragers, they interact with larvae, they interact with queen. So we thought that there would be a, a, a good, a good kind of place to start. And because they have a, a, a well-defined a well-defined age, uh, sorry, uh, you know, the, 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 the distribution of age of nurses is, is fairly kind of small relative to other casts uh, that we thought we'd focus on them uh, because we don't want to kind of confine, we, we, we don't want to collect nurses, a, a bunch of nurses and a bunch of foragers for the assay because we know that nurses and foragers differ a lot in, in gene expression and we want to minimize this like between mm -hmm. cast variation and gene expression on the assay. Okay. Mm. And I guess that can also for the for the sort of gut microbiota as well. That can could vary a little bit with the age. So good idea. Yeah, well, this, and also speaking about the gut, uh, I think Amro, you mentioned at some point uh, about pollen, and it could be also important to anything related to the gut. I mean. When you sampled your bees, were there uh, nurses or were they foragers? They they were uh, they were nurse bees. Yeah, but and Julia, in, in your uh, study, in which you looked at diversity according to uh, you know fields, yeah, uh, close to fields. Oh, were landscape. These, yeah, landscape study. Were these forager bees or were they nurses also because? Um, wow. Yeah, so they were they were taken um, from outside. So the, yeah, they were probably more likely foragers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there was one question uh, for Matthew in the Q and A um, regarding the difference between recombination rate in African and European bee. Uh, so it's Melanie Parlo that suggested that maybe. Uh, European bees have higher recombination rate because they include different subspecies or hybrids. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, would it be uh, easier to detect recombination in hybrids or, yeah, or basically it could recombination rate li be linked to the, the kind of mix up between the bees that we observe in Europe? I think there, there's, there's, not a there's not an issue about power to detect it because uh, they're supported by a, a lot of uh, SNPs each each crossover event, so it, that wouldn't make a difference. But uh, um, and I mean the idea that there's higher recombination is hybrid in hybrids is interesting. I I don't know of a a, a kind of a hypothesis about why that would be, but uh, um, it's 
it's possible. I think there were some old papers mentioning the fact that uh, domestic species might have, uh, in mammals anyhow, domestic species might have uh, higher recombination rates than wild uh, ancestors. Yeah, there's, there's been quite a, a kind of a long uh, debate about that. I mean, there, there certainly is evidence for example, in Drosophila, that strong selection leads to higher recombination rates um, for like a geotaxis, for example. Um, and so the idea was that could the domestication might be a similar factor, but I think the, uh, the early results haven't kind of been confirmed and there doesn't really seem to be a difference. Okay, yeah, I think there was it, in, of, in domestic and wild. Uh, yeah, because I think there were some studies also between wild boar and pigs and things like that. And speaking about other species, um, I've been working most of my life on, on, on poultry, and uh, in birds, typically there's a very strong difference, I mean, correlation between the size of the chromosome and the recombination rate. Have you had a look at something? Similar in bees. Um, uh, I think the uh, the the thing that's interesting with the birds, or the thing that's unusual about them, is that they have these micro chromosomes. Yes. And uh, so uh, those have very elevated rates because because of the re requirement to fit one crossover in a small region. Mm -hmm. um, um, in in bees, the they don't have that effect. The the main uh, Thing that we see is that there's a, a big re reduction around uh, um, centromeres. Okay. okay, I guess we are going to do one last question and I, it's probably going to be timed up for us today. Uh, there was a, a question in the Q&A by uh, Dave and oh, someone answered. Who is that? You can still comment out loud for everyone to hear, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I answered back with a with a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think Jay was uh, I think Jay was suggesting whether we could test uh, for uh, like SNPs as well as like expression in, of genes in bees or, or pathogens on, on the same chip. Is 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 that correct, Jay? I'm, I'm not sure whether Jay could. Uh, uh, oh, Jay can't speak. He, he can just okay. type. <laughs> Okay, so he 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 was he was said yeah. So he did type yes. Yeah, that that would that would be great. I I I just don't know whether that's feasible, but uh, it may be or may not. I'm just not familiar with that. So I'll, I'll perhaps leave it to uh, some of the more tech savvy folks to uh, to let me know if that's that's possible. But that would be super cool. I've activated Jay's line in case he wants to try to to talk there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Yeah. No, that answers it, Amro. I I figured there was a technical glitch to it, either in in incomplete coverage of some of the SNPs or the fact that they're in intergenic regions and such. So, but but it would be super helpful. Yeah, that would, that would be amazing. Okay. So I think we're coming to the end, and there was just one question that we found in the chat. It's quite general to everyone is, uh, what are your current thinkings about uh, honeybee health uh, worldwide? Um, any comments on that? I mean, everyone's saying that bees are going to disappear. It's terrible. <laughs> yeah, I'll, uh, maybe I'll, I'll quickly jump and say, I think the biggest problem is, is that uh, we, we are, uh, and I'm guilty of this as, as much as anybody is, is that we're, we're always thinking of honeybee health as, as a, a one stress, like one, one thing that is going to, that once we I, like discover, we'll be able to solve honeybee health forever. Uh, but uh, you know, the, the reality is bees live in a stressor world and, and, and we just, uh, as a community, we have to be better at dealing with multiple stresses. And also, I guess I'd add that it's, it's important to not just think about honeybees, you know, the, the, the honeybees do have the beekeepers to help them out basically whereas you know the wild bees bumblebees and so on perhaps they're the ones facing more of the issue than um than the honeybees perhaps a good thing about the honeybees is there is the beekeepers to alert people about the problem yeah, thank you. Yeah. and then you can look at the wild ones matt any comments <laughs> 
also? Um, I I agree very much with uh, with what what's been said. I mean, it's I think uh, a lot of the public are not so much aware of the difference between uh, wild and uh, managed beasts, but uh, I think. Uh, of becoming more aware of that, and I think certainly focusing on uh, on wild beasts and and the and the huge diversity that we have there is 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 an important thing that we need to do um, in the future. Um, but it's also great that uh, we're understanding more about all of the dis different stresses, so that we can uh, kind of work towards uh, removing some of the man-made ones. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Well. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's been a great session, great talks, and uh, great discussions. I hope we answered most of the questions that we asked by, by, by people. Uh, we want to thank uh, the organizers of uh, the AGSX uh, Symposium to have uh, Arthropod Symposium to have uh, welcomed the honeybee into. Uh, the series of talks. Uh, it's been great. And uh, we want to thank also the USDA for all the organization. Perhaps, Brad, uh, you want to add a few words on, on this? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I just kind of reiterate your uh, great appreciation to everybody, the organizers, and also all the, no pun intended, or maybe pun intended, all the busy bees in the background who've done a lot of the legwork. Um, those from the USDA, um, I5K, kind of help all of the organization or everything that's really necessary but people really don't take note of or appreciate but uh definitely do appreciate their help okay great well i guess uh that that's it for us for the for the attendees uh you can keep on the discussion with the presenter on the slack channel if you feel like it uh the questions will be posted there so uh just yeah enjoy enjoy uh Keeping on asking questions to, to our great yes, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Slack channel is still open for yeah. questions. Yeah, that's <laughs> yes, and the, the uh, link to join, if you have not already, is in the chat. So please uh, copy that over and, and join if you wish. Okay. Well, sure. thank you, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you again. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.